and welcome to The Vaccine. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Coming up, will the economy get a post-lockdown boost this festive season? We'll see if the Christmas cheer is being felt by some of the industry's hardest hit by COVID. But first, as we pull into the last few weeks of the year, the vaccination rollout is being expanded yet again. This time, it's for 5 to 11-year-olds who will get the protection. More than 2 million Australian children will be eligible. Initially, they'll receive the Pfizer vaccine, with Moderna also seeking approval to join the rollout. This is the next step in protecting Australians. It will give parents confidence, it will give parents choice, it will give children protection, it will give their families protection and it will give their schools protection. Dr Margie Danchen is a paediatrician and immunisation expert at the University of Melbourne and Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Dr Danchen, thanks for joining us. How strong do you expect the uptake of vaccinations for 5 to 11 year olds be this time? So this is such great news to see the Pfizer vaccine recommended for primary school aged children. And we have seen a very strong and high uptake in the teenage age group of now over 87% of the teens vaccinated. So we would hope that parents come forward now and get the, uh, their primary school aged children vaccinated. And we hope there'll be a very strong response, especially to get at least one dose in before kids start term one school next year. Do you expect the hesitancy that we saw in older population groups to flow onto this younger group? It's hard to say. Uh, at the moment, we know that this vaccine has been shown to be safe. It's been given to over 5 million children in the United States and at least 1.4 million have had a second dose of the vaccine and there's no vaccine safety signal for the myocarditis or the inflammation of the heart or pericarditis or the inflammation of the lining around the heart and, and those safety questions have been very uh, pressing and concerning for parents so we want parents to access trustworthy and reputable information. We know they have questions um, to, to have them answered, speak to their GP. And I think importantly, we also want to make sure that they can access the vaccine easily. And then I think we'll see a really good uptake of the vaccine. Can you give us a sense of what it is ATAGI and the TGA have been assessing up to this point to give that sort of confidence to the system? Well, the vaccine clinical trial in this age group uh, has now included 5,000 children. And the trial did show that um, kids of this age group had a really nice, strong immune response, that the vaccine was over 90% uh, effective against clinical infection, and that those common and expected side effects did not happen uh, more often than in the teens and the, the young adults. But it wasn't able to give us any information on those rarer and more serious side effects that I mentioned. So. Now that 5 million kids in the US have had it, which is double the entire uh, paediatric population of this age group in Australia, uh, and we haven't seen a vaccine safety signal, I think parents can be really reassured and learn from the US experience. Uh, kids are going to start getting these vaccinations on the 10th of January. Conceivably, a lot of kids are going to get their first or second doses once school starts. Do you foresee a time where nurses, pharmacists, doctors will be stationed in schools to help um, carry out this rollout or will this be done outside the school system? The vaccine will predominantly be rolled out through participating general practices and, and pharmacies as well as some of the vaccination hubs. Running a school-based program for primary school kids is a bit more challenging. We do see a really strong uh, school-based program run in secondary schools in Australia, uh, but that's because parents can provide consent at home and the kids can be vaccinated by class at school. With primary school aged children, we need the parent present. So we're more anticipating weekend pop-up clinics with parents uh, where they can be there to support the child to get their vaccine. Dr Marga Danchen, good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Well, the pandemic could end up costing the next couple of generations trillions of dollars in debt. I caught up with the ABC's business editor in Sydney's CBD. Ian Verinder, very good to see you. Good to be here, Jerry. Uh, here we are in the centre of Sydney. People are finally out in the streets again. But, you know, you go around the corner and you see shops are still closed. Um, 
there seems to be confidence there, but it's fairly shaky. How would you rate the economic recovery as it's going post Look, lockdown, post COVID? I guess it's very early to tell now because New South Wales, Sydney has just emerged from a lockdown. Melbourne, Victoria, the same. Um, I think what you're going to find is that in the lead up to Christmas, there'll be an enormous bounce in, in spending. Uh, we've been shut out of shops, we've been out of restaurants and cafes, we haven't been able to do anything. There's still an awful lot of government stimulus money circulating through the economy. Savings rates have actually jumped to near record levels from around 12% to 20%. So there's a lot of pent up demand, there's a lot of savings in the bank and we're coming up to Christmas. So I think you'll find that everyone will be out and about and trying to spend as much as they can in the next few weeks. So what does it look like after Christmas then? Well, that's a difficult question, I guess. Um, I get one of the saving factors for us is that we have one of the best vaccination rates in the world and that will instill quite a bit of confidence. Hopefully as well, this new variant, Omicron, will be far less damaging health-wise. It certainly seems that it's been a fairly patchy sort of recovery um, across the economy, not just here, but around the world as well. How long does that go for and where does it leave that ledger of winners and losers? It really gets down to the, the virus itself though, doesn't it? I mean, because if you get stronger variants that are really damaging to health, um, that will uh, it, it mean more lockouts. We're seeing that already across Europe at the moment because of their very low vaccination rates. So it really gets down to vaccination and what happens with the variants, whether they are more damaging from a health perspective or not. Is this the same picture we're seeing overseas as well? You mentioned Europe going back into lockdowns. We've heard here politically a real aversion to going back into lockdowns that, you know, some politicians saying this will never happen again. Yeah. Do you think the economic imperatives behind that are going to drive you know, how, how they respond? I don't think you can ever say never yeah. because one of the more interesting things that's come out of this entire pandemic is that the studies have really shown that there isn't a trade-off between health and the economy. The countries and the states that have best protected their populations from a health perspective are the ones that have done the best economically. Uh, you know, even last year, right back in the early stages of this pandemic, uh, there was a big study done by McKinsey's, the management firm out of America, and they really debunked that whole theory that you had a trade-off. You either had to keep the economy alive or protect the health. And what they found was the countries that had best protected their health had done much better. So New Zealand, in fact, had done better uh, than Sweden even though Sweden had basically let the virus run rampant, had kept the economy open, by New Zealand closing itself off to the rest of the world and keeping its population healthy, there was a lot more confidence in that economy. People were far more likely to spend money and keep things afloat. What does that mean though then for countries like New Zealand, states like Western Australia, Queensland, Tasmania, South Australia, which are gradually welcoming COVID in, they're doing the reverse of what New South Wales and Victoria have been doing. Does their economic profile then change over the coming months? Um, it again gets down to what mutates out of this virus. I think ultimately Western Australia and the states that are keeping themselves locked down have to get their vaccination rates up. They have to have a population that's confident enough to get out and about and allow people into the into the state. I mean, you know, we talked about the economy doing better in those in those states and countries that had actually protected the health, but some industries within those areas had been absolutely smashed. And I mean, you know, travel, for instance, has just been decimated uh, in this country. And we're a country that really relies on travel. I mean, it's our third biggest export industry. And so there are other countries such as in the Pacific, smaller countries in the Caribbean and so forth, and some countries in Africa that rely heavily on travel, their economies have been really, really badly impacted. We are coming into an election year in 2022. Uh, we are going to be hearing a lot about the economy, about the recovery from COVID and who you should and shouldn't vote for. We're not going to tell people who to vote for, obviously. How should people, though, assess the claims that are going to be made about economic management and recovery from COVID yeah. in the next few months? I think Australia is a small, very trade-exposed nation, 
and we are at the whims of global forces. There is nothing really that one party could do better than another party, I don't think, in terms of economic management. If you look at Western Australia, the fact that they actually shut down themselves, their export industry, iron ore, the, the biggest export earner for the country, was allowed to operate absolutely unfettered. Compare that to Brazil, where they essentially had COVID running wild right through their mines. They had to shut down a lot of their mines as a result of that. We benefited from that, from that system. I think there isn't really a lot that either party could do that is going to be much better than the other. Ian Verin, it's so good to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. As lockdowns, restrictions and border closures ease in most parts of the country, artists and entertainers are looking forward to a much better year in 2022. The government has today announced an allocation of $6.2 million to five major arts organisations that are dealing with the aftermath of the pandemic. One of those organisations is the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Its principal conductor in residence has stepped out of rehearsals to join us. Benjamin Northey, it's terrific to have you on the program. Tell me, what is it like rehearsing for live shows and performing in front of crowds for you? That's, uh, I think we've realised what we've missed and it's been the people that we perform for. And I, I've said that to audiences in the last couple of weeks. You know, it's only been really the last two weeks that we've been able to welcome audiences back to our concerts. And it's that exchange of uh, energy, of sharing something beautiful together again, uh, such as music, such as the arts, that is so sustaining. And so it's been a, a great boost to all of us. Are you finding that some people are a bit reticent into heading into certain venues, particularly in closed auditoriums, where they might feel that there is a bit of a health risk there? What do you say to them? Yes, um, the venues are so well run. I mean, especially here in Melbourne, we've got this wonderful art centre that are managed so beautifully. They have taken into account so many of these risk factors uh, and, and really addressed them. They're beautifully ventilated buildings. They've got very, very strong vaccination policies for everybody who enters the building as well. Uh, hygiene's obviously at the front of everybody's mind. And uh, they've done everything that they can to make these venues as safe as possible. We've also been performing quite a lot outdoors at the Sydney Mine Music Bowl here in Melbourne. We're very lucky to have that venue as well. But I encourage people who might be a little bit uh, apprehensive to um, come along and give it a go. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at, at how well that issue has been addressed. Has COVID changed the sorts of shows that are being produced? I'm thinking about the limits that we've had up till recently on crowd sizes and the sorts of venues that could have people in them. Yeah, shows with large audience expectations, uh, and I'm talking about market forces here really, they have definitely been delayed. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, we've had more recording projects. We've had more online performances. And I think there's been a little bit more adventure in our programming as well, uh, which is wonderful to see. But um, yeah, certainly it's, it's, uh, it's been a very, very difficult time uh, in terms of just the numbers and, and that's box office revenue and that's industry wide. That's not just the major performing arts organisations, that's everybody. There are some in the sector, in the arts and entertainment sector who received JobKeeper, some didn't. Do you get a sense of how well the recovery is happening right across it or is it fairly patchy in the sector right now? I think it's patchy uh, geographically as well. You know, New South Wales and Victoria have been so hard hit by comparison with other states that they've, they've definitely noticed that it's more severe here, the, the slowdown. And, you know, we're talking about major performing arts organisations, but we have to remember this is industry wide. There are people out there who are freelance artists who literally have no gigs to play. They have no music to make. The uh, events that they are their lifeblood are, are, are just not happening in the numbers that they used to. And so I think it's this awareness that the entire industry really needs a lot of support and also an understanding that it's a valuable sector. It has so many uh, ramifications for other industries when this industry isn't, isn't uh, thriving as it normally does. Benjamin, just finally, I've seen a huge slate of shows in front of you for the next few weeks. What is your message to audiences? Uh, look, you don't realise what you've missed until you get it back. It's not when it's gone, it's when you get it back. And all of our audiences have come along to our concerts and they have left uplifted, inspired, uh, reminded that the world is a great place to be alive in. And that's what the arts can do. And so don't forget that that experience is there for you again now. And musicians and artists of all kinds will welcome you back with open arms. 
Benjamin Northey, so great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeremy. And that is the show for this week. Thanks for your company. Bye for now. <laughs>